Well, I'm so glad that you're here this morning and that I get I have another opportunity to be with you. If you appreciate the worship team real fast, let's let them know. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Shekinah. Uh, typically, I'm over with Kids Church. I love, I have the opportunity to be the children's pastor here, and I just have the best time with your children. So thank you for trusting me with them. Quickly, I just want to remind the ladies, we have our Flourish event coming up. So if you haven't signed up, there's sign-ups in the back and online. Just love for you to spend time with us. It's going to be August 26th. That's a Friday evening at 7 o'clock. It's a very casual time where we just come together, co- um, connect with each other, and just try to draw near to our Heavenly Father. And we have a special guest, Joy Krychek, who's going to be with us. And she's just a blessing. So you will be blessed by her, and you don't want to miss it. So try to come, please. All right, so last week we started um, talking about the life of Daniel. We were looking at this um, story found in Daniel where the, um, the boys have been taken captive to Babylon and they choose to not eat the king's food. And the challenge was put before us of like, are we dieting on the culture that is being shoved in our face? Or are we just like those young boys at the time choosing to say no? And um, we talked about how it was the Babylonian style to just strip their captives of their identity. And we talked about how they changed their name right away from a name that was like God-driven and God-centered to almost mocking him. And we talked about how we have, if you have a biblical worldview, you're now in the worldview minority. The dominant worldview of the culture around us is secularism. And it's fundamentally at odds with a biblical worldview. And this is opposing and often hostile to, set, um, to and it puts pressure on Christians of what they believe, the ways um, our beliefs inform how we think and how we live out our faith. And so we talked about how the latest research, all the, all the latest research says about 65% of Americans self-identify as Christians. And that didn't quite settle or feel right. And so... When you look a little further, um, we find that researchers asked questions about specific beliefs and behaviors. When they did that, only about 10% of Americans have what would be considered a biblical worldview. And that just means that they hold basic beliefs consistent with the Christian faith, and they exhibit corresponding behaviors. So in other words, your behaviors will go in line with what you believe. Only 10%. And so we put the challenge, I put the challenge out there for all of us just to go home and sit with that and ask the Lord, like, where are some areas that we need to uh, work on? Because Revelation 3, 2 says, I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what little remains. What challenge for all of us, for different areas and for different reasons, but to strengthen what little remains because... We are in a culture that is vying for our attention, that is constantly contradicting what those of us who would say we're in the 10% believe. And um, I just think the book of Daniel is such a great place to start as a launching pad. Um, I said in first service, look, I know Daniel is a, a rich, heavy, phenomenal book, and I am not for one second trying to like dissect that book. I just want to pull out stories and Um, pull some truths out. And so this morning, I want to look at another story in the book of Daniel and see what we can apply to our lives today. So let's go to the fiery furnace this morning. (laughs) Um, In Daniel 3, we see that Daniel's friends face a very tense moment. Nebuchadnezzar set up that huge golden image on the plain of Dura. He's commanded all the people to bow down and worship it. If they refuse, what happens? They're thrown into a fiery furnace. Three refused to obey the king, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So spies report this disobedience. And we read in verse 12. It says, There are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage. This is like par for the course with this man and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they are brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is this true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I've set up? 
I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I've made when you hear the sound of the musical instrument. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? That could be its own whole message. I mean, if you, for me, if ever you read a moment in scripture where there's just such courage and boldness, it's just the response we're about to read of these boys. The way they respond to him. I mean, think about Nebuchadnezzar as a madman. Like, if he was living nowadays, he would have all the labels. Narcissist, sociopath, rageaholic, madman. I mean, he is, he's nuts. But can you imagine they stay really calm? They don't let fear overtake their faith. They don't just say, like, oh, my gosh, we're, you're right. We didn't get the memo. We're so sorry. Play that musical instrument. We're going to capitulate. Like, we're on it. Their response in the face of his anger, it never ceases to amaze me. It never ceases to minister to me when I read this story. And it should be um, a pattern for our response as we face the culture pressures that we're facing. So we see in verse 17, it says, this is what they say. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. They look this man calmly in the eye and say, we want to make it clear to you, actually. We heard what you said, but we're going to make it very clear. We will never bow down. They didn't go into all the reasons why not. They didn't give excuses. They didn't plead for their lives. They knew what God had said in Exodus 20, second commandment. You shall not make yourself an image and you shall not bow down to them or worship them. So they said, we know that God is able to save us, but even if he doesn't, we don't regret this decision at all. Where did they get that kind of courage? That's what I've been sitting with. Where did that come from? To think they were plucked from their homeland as young men, as young teenagers. Young teenagers, they were taken. The Babylonians have done all they can to strip them of their identity, strip them of what they know to be true. They had settled what they believed before they were even ever taken captive. And so they were able to endure the trials that they face. And so the thing I just want to sit with for a while this morning, the thing that I love so much about this story, about this moment, is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're young teenagers when they're taken, right? They're young. That means that the things that were deposited in them as young people, as children and young teens, was enough to sustain them to stand firm in their faith for the rest of their life. Let that sit with us for a minute. Daniel was 16 when he was taken, and, and that faith was enough to last him his whole life through. And we see he never wavers in it. I just find this to be such a challenge for us as parents who are raising our kids in light of the culture that we're in. And while we're, there's so many distractions and um, influences vying for their attention, we need to be encouraged this morning that what we're doing with these young years, can make all the difference. And we see that in the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I've been doing a lot of reading and studying, preparing for this, and so, you know, I'm going to say a, a lot of quotes and uh, just get ready, but in doing that, I've just seen a lot of antagonistic statements towards those of us who want to be in that 10%. Um, and those who are trying to raise our children to have a lasting faith. Let me just read to you one such statement. It's from a psychologist. His name's Nicholas Humphrey, and he gave the Oxford Amnesty Lecture. The purpose of this was to argue in favor of censorship against freedom of expression. Specifically, it was to censor moral and religious education. And this is what he said. Children have a right not to have their minds addled by nonsense, and we as a society have a duty to protect them from it. So we should no more allow parents to teach their children to believe, for example, in the literal truth of the Bible than we should, or than we should allow parents to knock their children's teeth out or lock them in a dungeon. So, like, really, this guy, to teach children the truth of the Bible is equivalent to him as knocking our children's teeth out or locking them in a dungeon? 
It's, it's irreprehensible to him that a parent would teach their children the truth of the Bible. But Psalm 78, 4, we know, says, We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. It's our job as parents to impart to our children a lasting faith based on the truth of the word of God, despite what our antagonistic culture is saying. Listen to this. A recent study compared teens who lack a solid biblical belief system to that of their peers who who have one. It revealed that teens who lack a solid biblical belief system are 225% more likely to be angry with life, 216% more likely to be resentful, 210% more likely to lack purpose in life, 200% more likely to be disappointed in life, 200% more likely to steal, 200% more likely to physically hurt someone, 300% more likely to use illegal drugs, and 600% more likely to attempt suicide. But he doesn't want us to teach our children biblical truths. Does it really stay with them? Does it really matter? I mean, if you're a parent in here, I'm sure you are like, what's the point? It's so crazy out there. Not really, but we have questions. How, does, how do we do this? There's so many questions we're trying to figure out. But make no mistake, parents, we have the largest role, the largest role in helping to shape our children's faith. And before I go any further, I just want to say this, because I say it often if I'm up here. If you're in here and you don't have kids, or your kids are grown, you don't have young kids or teenagers, I'm still talking to you right now. I really am, because we need spiritual parents, as Pastor Josh just said, now more than ever. Kids come through these doors who don't go home to a Christ-centered home. Teenagers are coming here on their own. They're not coming here with parents who are bringing them here. We need you to be pouring into them. When maybe you're hearing like, I've raised my kid, I have done my time. (laughs) I don't want to do that anymore. That's fine, but can you pour into their parents? Can you spend time with their parents? Can you encourage their parents? Not every parent here at Harvest had or has a godly parent they can go to for advice. So can you make yourself available to them? Truly, this church, all of us collectively have a role to play in the next generation and helping impart lasting faith in their lives. And so you might be thinking, you know, it's kind of, I don't know how big of an influence I'm having on my kid. The culture is loud right now, and I feel like it's louder than me. Well, let me, this is where I said I'm going to just spit some statistics out at you, okay? So uh, let's go back to the book I quoted last week, The Myth of the Dying Church by Glenn Stanton, okay? They said the best research is surprisingly and absolutely consistent and unequivocal about what the number one resource in successful transmission of faith is and why it is singularly as effective as it is. The first factor is number one, parents. Let's see how it rates among the next three things that nearly guarantee our children will take a living and lasting faith with them into adulthood. Number two, parents. Number three, they said parents. Number four, parents. And these are followed by the next two important, number five parents, number six parents. It's parents. Like unequivocally, they said, it's parents. And like, well, I like to think that I, myself, along with all our wonderful children's ministry volunteers, have a huge role and a great impact in your children's life and helping them to develop genuine faith. It absolutely pales in comparison to the influence that comes from their parents good or bad. And while Pastor Josh and Bree are working hard alongside of their leaders to pour into the teenagers at this church, it can't compare to what they get or not get from their parents at home. There's no complicated spiritual formula that you have to get just perfectly right, say amen, if you're... (laughs) There's no special product you need to buy, no programs or conference you need to sign up for and attend. None of this requires any of us to be spiritual superheroes. There is um, a great deal of grace involved in the process, and according to all the research, it's it's actually that we'll be quite successful if we do it. It's actually likely that we'll be successful. So here's the bottom line. The things that successful parents do in faith transmission is not rocket science, but the payoff in doing it is eternal. It's eternal. 
And I think we need to hear this and become encouraged as parents. Whether you realize it or not, you are the most powerful force in molding, challenging, encouraging, and directing your children. So two of the largest and most long-term studies ever conducted with young people and their faith development, one was from the University of Southern California and the other was from the University of North Carolina, both emphasized, and they said without fear of overstatement, how critical they found parent involvement to be. Dr. Vern Berkston, working from USC, or U- yeah, USC, presents the collective findings of his four-decade-long study. That's time. Investigation into this matter. He wrote a book called Families and Faith, How Religion is Passed Down Across Generations. And he states in his book, confidently at the conclusion, that passing on their faith to their children in the following generations, religious families are actually surprisingly successful. Don't, don't you feel like you're hearing the opposite everywhere? Like there's no hope for us? Yeah. Everything you read, the blogs, all of it. Professor Christian Smith, working from his own massive multi-year, several million dollar study, said parents are huge, absolutely huge, nearly a necessary condition for a child to adopt a lasting and living faith. So he says, without question, the most important pastor a child will ever have in their life is their parent. His findings show that 85% of teens raised by parents who took their faith very seriously and lived in a home with consistent Faith practices became young adults who not only had a serious faith, but had the highest level of religious belief and practice among their peers. So this to me is really encouraging and really sobering at the same time. It's really encouraging because despite what we feel sometimes or think or being told, we actually have the greatest impact on our kids and our teens. But it's sobering because if we aren't living that out in our personal lives, And if we are participating in that bow-down culture, that has lasting impact as well. Glenn Stanton says, what what, what can we conclude? He said, like begets like. Parents with a weak faith or no faith at all tend to produce children with a weak faith or no faith at all. Parents who hold and practice a vibrantly strong and attractive faith tend to produce children who have a vibrant and attractive faith. That makes sense. Being a children's pastor here at Harvest, and I'm sure if I brought Pastor Josh up, he would have some commentary on this as well. You know, I'm always really amazed to see how few kids in our ministry come on a weekly basis. And like, hear my heart. I'm not saying anything for a second to have anyone feel condemned or like I'm judging them because Far be it from me. Romans 8.1 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So I'm not saying this in a condemning or judging way, but I am concerned by how very few families have put into practice the rhythm of coming coming to church weekly. I can't help but wonder why parents think that if they haven't put this rhythm and this practice into motion when their children are young, that somehow when they're young adults, they're going to magically start this practice up. Now, we just heard that church actually isn't the largest influence on our child's lasting faith, right? The parents are, and I get that. But I tend to think that if you haven't put the practice and the discipline into going to church weekly, chances are the other spiritual disciplines might be lacking as well in the home too. Stanton writes, over the last several decades, thousands of studies published in peer-reviewed journals over and over again document that the practice of attending church is associated with making people happy, healthier, better spouses, more generous, more ethical, more tolerant, despite what they say, and more civically engaged and responsible citizens. Active churchgoers are more likely to experience better physical and mental health. Other studies have examined how religious participation is linked to education, educational achievements, character development, longevity, coping, and stress reduction. And still other research demonstrates how church attendance can help decrease crime and delinquency and how religious practices help increase sobriety among those who are addicts in treatment. And here my heart, I really can stand up here and look you in the eye and say this is not a plea to get you to come to harvest. It's not about what church you're going to. It's truly about being in church and being rooted in Grounded with a family of believers. 
help your children, help them learn the rhythm that can serve them the rest of their lives. And I am not talking about legalism here. Like, we can't miss a Sunday. Like, none of us pastors are here taking role. It's not that. It's just doing our best to be in church. It will help us put that foundation in our kids. So the process is not that difficult, but the results are eternal. And God is such a gracious father who desires our children's hearts and their well-being. And so he wants to partner with us to do the significant work. It's not all on us. Amen? Amen. Deuteronomy 6.6 6 says, Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away and when you lie down and when you rise. There's an amazing story about two families that span several generations and both trace their lineage back to um, early colonial American, back to two men who lived in early colonial America. One called himself Jukes, but his name's not so important. He was constantly coming up with a new alias and to stay a step ahead of the law. Jukes was, according to his neighbors, a shiftless, lazy, no account. The little that he managed to scrape together was mostly gained by his marginal skills as a petty thief. But Mr. Jukes was never clever enough to outwit the local sheriff. He was constantly in and out of jail. His wife was a woman of low morals who spent too much time in a drunken stupor. But here's the interesting thing, friends. At the turn of the 20th century, a series of sociologists managed to uncover 1,200 descendants in the Jukes family tree. Listen to this. Some 300 were professional beggars. More than 100 were convicted criminals. 60 were thieves and pickpockets. At least 400 of them were drunkards or drug addicts. Another seven were convicted murderers, although several more were suspects. More than 50 of them spent time in mental institutions. Of the 1,200 descendants discovered by the educators, only 20 ever learned a trade. Half who did learn their trade in prison. Less than 200 of the Jukes descendants finished high school and none attended college. The Jukes family record was one of pauperism and prison, imbecility and insanity, prostitution, panhandling, drunkenness, and drug abuse. Another sociologist studied the family tree of a colonial contemporary of Jukes. He was a preacher, as were, were his father and grandfather. Scholars say that he was the greatest theologian and philosopher ever produced in America. His dynamic preaching sparked a great spiritual awakening that birthed the American Revolution. Maybe you remember this third president of Princeton, the Reverend Jonathan Edwards, and his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. But you may not have ever shaken his family tree to see what fell out. A total of 400 descendants have been traced to Jonathan Edwards and his wife, Sarah. Listen to this. Among them was a U.S. vice president, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college and university presidents, 30 judges, around 65 of Edwards' progeny were college professors, another 100 were ministers, missionaries, and seminary professors, 80 were public office holders, and his family tree were 100 lawyers and 60 medical doctors. Several descendants had written books, published newspapers, and been editors of journals. Until the beginning of the 20th century, every major industry in America had as its founder or promoter an offspring of Jonathan and Sarah Edwards. Most families are a mixed bag of success and failures. Few are as dismal as the Jukes descendants or as stellar as Edwards' prodigy, progeny. But the contrast can't be missed and the lesson can't be dismissed. Parents have a profound impact on their world for generations to come. Nothing is more important than the responsibility and the possibility of parenthood. The story of these two families shouts out a message. Your children will become who you are, so be who you want them to be. Proverbs 22, 6, direct your children on the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. So be in church. Take your faith with you throughout the week. Live it loudly in front of your children. Gather them around you. Invest in them. Pour into them. Read scripture with them. Devotionals with them. Talk to them in and throughout your day about things in light of what God says about this. Take it home and live it out loud because it will really make a difference. 
So back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the story found in Daniel chapter 3. I, I truly, I love that you see that they took what was deposited in them, and they made such a stand. And this is his response to the refusal to bow. In verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. I mean, that seems intimidating. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual and then ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. And if we skip down to verse 23, it says, So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. And we know what happens next in this all too familiar story. They were not burned and they were not harmed. And so in verse 28, it says, Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. So what effect did this have on Nebuchadnezzar? For a minute, he was calm. He was filled with great admiration for the miraculous power of God and and these men, all because they refused to bow and worship a golden image. And I want to say it's kind of tricky for us today because most of the time idols in our life don't come in the form of a big golden statue. It's a lot more subtle than that, right? And a lot of times we don't even realize it's happening. It's like subconsciously and all of a sudden we have an idol in our life. It just sneaks up on us. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, A person will worship something, have no doubt about that. We may think our tribute is paid in a secret in the dark recesses of our heart, but it will out. That which dominate our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship, for what we are worshiping, we are becoming. It's all about what's in our heart. It's centered around what matters most to us, who or what gets our attention, where does all our time and energy and money go. If you just answer those simple questions, and if God's not up in the mix of that, then chances are there's some idols that are, have snuck into your life. And we tell kids all the time in kids' church, an idol is just something that takes the place of God. It comes in many forms, and how many know we see it everywhere in our culture right now. But 1 Corinthians 10, 14 says, My dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. I like this quote by Don Richard in, in Eternity in Their Hearts. He said, Once men reject the one omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent God in the favor of lesser deities, they eventually discover to their frustration that it takes an infinite number of lesser deities to fill the true God's shoes. Isn't that good? So it is worth time, just taking some time this week and evaluating our lives, rereading chapter 3 and just asking the Lord if we have allowed idols to come into our life and inadvertently, not even always on purpose, not realizing we're worshiping and we're bowing down. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down. And the last thing I want to point out this morning, I find it, it's so simple, but I love that they so boldly stand firm and speak truth. They speak truth. It's one thing to not bow in private in your little quarters. It's a whole other thing to not bow in public when everybody's looking at you and a madman screaming in your face. The king raged out on these boys and still they stood their ground and they spoke the truth. Think about how angry our culture gets. Who's ever had an intense conversation with someone who has different beliefs? How angry people get at us for believing the things that we do, for having the audacity to speak truth. But Larry Osborne wrote a book called Thriving in Babylon. He said, things that were once shamefully hidden are now publicly celebrated. The previously unimaginable has become commonplace, and in a few short decades, our culture's response to Bible-believing Christians has gone from grudging respect to a patronizing pat on the head to a marginalizing indifference to outright hostility. So here we stand as Christians, as the ones who want to be in that 10%. And the truth is we have so many opportunities in our daily life to speak truth. Colossians 1.23 says, But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. It's not always easy to speak truth. It can be extremely difficult to know when to do it, 
how to do it, with whom to do it. And there's a lot being written right now on the silent church. I have no commentary either way. I always just take things and make them personal to myself. I don't have the, the answer for the whole world of the church. I just know for me, I'm responsible to speak truth in my life, right? I don't have this huge platform to speak truth to the whole world, but if I'm at the park with two other mothers and they are speaking lies from our culture, in that moment as a Christian, I have the decision to choose to remain silent or to speak up in truth, to stand firmly in it and speak truth. And let's say it's a lot less intimidating than what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were facing with that lunatic king and it's the same for all of us it's the same for you when we're at work when we're at school in the line at the grocery store at your kids soccer practice on all the social media platforms if we're paying attention these moments come up almost daily where we have the opportunity to just let it go by or to stand firmly and speak truth and we said it last week Daniel didn't do things in a judgmental way or a self-righteous way. There truly is a way to not come across like we think we have all the answers and we're, we have it all together, but to humbly just stand firm and speak truth in boldness. And when we speak truth, when we're speaking truth, it's sharing the truth out of our love for God and our love for others. And when we share from that right motivation, speaking truth is not just expressing words, it's an act of love. Look at what Ephesians 4.15 says. It says, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. So in his book, The Gathering Storm, Albert Moeller says, I believe that Christians bear the highest responsibility in this secular age. Just consider what's entrusted to us. We know the true foundation of human dignity and human rights. We know why every human life at every age under every condition is precious. We know why truth is truth. We know that sin is what explains the brokenness of this world. And we know just how broken it is, starting with ourselves. Courtney, if you want to come on up. We're living in a culture that is so full of lies. And the only way to combat it is with the truth. Amen. But we have to know the truth if we're going to speak the truth. Yes. We know John 8.32 says, you will know the truth, right? And the truth will set you free. John 14.6 says, Jesus told them, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the truth of God is a shield. It's our shield. Psalms 91.4 says, his truth shall be your shield and buckler. That sounds pretty good. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and will guide us as we navigate the lies of culture. John 16, 13 says, When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. John 17, 17 says, He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. So we're sanctified by truth. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify just means to be set apart, right? So when, when we start to speak the truth, we see it all the time. People are set apart, right? But we're sanctified by the truth. And we see our culture is summed up in Romans 1, They traded the truth of God for a lie. And it, it is our responsibility to speak truth into that in our world, in the world, and in the moments that the Lord entrusts us with, to speak to those lies. Our prayer should be Psalms 25 too, every single day. It just says this, lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. It's just such a good perspective to have as we I don't know if anyone else ever has to like talk themselves into like, it's good, we're okay. <laughs> it's all going to be, it's fine. It can feel overwhelming and intimidating sometimes. And we just have to reorient our thoughts and remember God leads us by his truth. And he honors us when we stand for truth. So we seek the truth. We speak the truth. And we live the truth. Ephesians 4, 15. 
4.14 says, We will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind and new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies. So clever, they sound like the truth. Sounds like a lot of the progressive churches out there. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. So just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we are facing mounting pressures in our culture. And sometimes it feels like speaking the truth is getting harder and harder. And it's like far be it for me to stand up here and pretend like it's an easy thing. Some of you go to high pressure jobs where you are just surrounded, surrounded by Babylonian culture. And I know it's not easy to be the only one who has a different perspective. But I also have to say, if we're gonna, if we're gonna be that 10%, who have a biblical worldview, we have to find the courage like those young men did, and we have to stand firm and speak truth. So how do we live courageously in a culture where people who shout the loudest win the argument? How do we live during a time when Christianity is openly being remade in a blend to be more comfortable into this secularized culture? I love Ewan Lutzer's response to these questions, and he said simply this, I want to inspire us to have the courage to walk toward the fire and not run away from the flames. God has brought us to this cultural moment and our future cannot be taken for granted. As has been said, in a time of universal deception, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. A few months ago, I was listening to this podcast. Don't even know what it was. Just know what stuck with me. And they're telling the story. They're giving an update on this woman, this missionary woman that their ministry had been supporting. They didn't tell us. We weren't allowed to know her name. They never said a name. They're just telling the story of this woman who, when all that stuff went down with Afghanistan and people were coming out, she went in. She told them, I have to go tell my people the truth. I have to get in there and tell the truth. And they said, how can we help you? And this was her response. She said, please get as many people to pray for me. And please tell them when they pray for me, pray that I die quickly. Most of us don't have to face that kind of pressure. We just need to speak up. She went back knowing she's going to die. And she just is praying that she can die quickly. The challenge is for each and every single one of us to speak truth into a culture that is dominated by the lies of the enemy. In a time of universal deception, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. 2 Corinthians 13.8 says, For we cannot oppose the truth, but must always stand for the truth. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes, if I'm honest, it's hard to even know how to pray because I know we're all individuals who hear what what we're going to hear. And so my prayer is simply this, God, that you would just speak to us, your children, and that each and every one of us would be challenged the way we need to be challenged to live the life that we need to live. God, I pray that we wouldn't fear the culture that is mounting all around us, but Lord, that we would have such a confidence in the truth that we have and that we live by, that we want to give it away frequently to others. Just as that woman couldn't stay in her safe surrounding, she left a safe, secure home to go and speak truth. I pray that we would be burdened by the truth, Father pray that as we sit with this story this week that you would um, pull truths out that we can apply to our life and minister to us not just past this moment but as we go about our week. I pray that parents would leave here encouraged knowing that every single thing they're doing right now to impart a lasting faith in their children is making a difference and that our children are going to serve you 
and that it will make all the difference in eternity. And if you're here this morning and maybe you haven't adopted the truth yet for your own life, maybe you don't have a memory of a time where you came to a place where you acknowledged that you want to give God that authority and that place in your life, no one's looking around, but I just want to give you an opportunity before we end. If that's you, I'd love to pray with you. If you just want to raise your hand, I'm just looking around real quickly before we end. We always just want to give people an opportunity to make sure that they are living by the truth. All right, thank you, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you be with us the rest of this day, that like I prayed earlier, that people who needed a touch from you will leave here just feeling encouraged and like they met with their Father, Lord. I thank you that you're faithful, that every week when we come together and when we lift you up, God, you're in our midst. And so we don't take that for granted. We're so thankful, Lord, that we're in a place where we're safe as we worship together. Lord, I pray that we would strengthen what remains and, Lord, that we would be alive and um, courageous to stand strong on the truth, Father, and speak it out. Thank you so much for the rest of this day. I pray that you'd be with everyone and that they would be safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So uh, have a wonderful week. Say it every week, but we don't say it flippantly. If you need prayer, we're here to pray for you. And we have gifts for the teachers in the back. And just be blessed and have a wonderful week.